Hello everyone, welcome to this virtual Kansas Fest session. My name is Olive Zardini, and I'm going to present you today how our next to be released software named Siren. This is a cross-platform development tool used to improve the debugging of Apple II and Apple IIGS software running on an emulator. This 30-minute session will be divided in four parts. As first, we are going to discuss about the way we were developing software in the 90s and the way we do it now, and what are the still missing features which, at the end, drive us to create Siren. So we'll discuss about Siren architecture, his interaction with operating system, Windows here, and his integration with a popular Apple IIG simulator named Kegs. So we'll demonstrate the software in two ways. First, by using the software to analyze live running application on the Apple IIGS emulator, and at the end, showing how Siren can be used in the development of Apple IIGS programs. Our history with Apple IIGS programming starts at the beginning of the 90s by the release in 1992 of a game named BeArt. So we quickly move to the adaptation of existing software on other platforms, such as Tiny, which is coming from that RST, Cogito, that we adapt from the Macintosh, Blockade, that was coming from Mac, my Spark workstation, and Lemmings, which was a mix of Apple Atari ST, Amiga, and uh, Macintosh settings. Sometime, we were also needed to adapt or develop our own in-house software, like utilities. For example, the color screen of Tiny's uh, is a 3200 color screen. And at the time, in 1993, there were no available graphic converter for such pictures. So we have started what will, at the end, be released as Convert 3200, a software capable to adapt high color Macintosh pictures to the Apple IIGS screen. The way we were developing software at the time was about always the same. First, we have to locate the hardware running the software. So it could be an Atari ST, Amiga, uh, and so on. And so we have first to run the software on the source platform, find a way to extract the content uh, of the game asset, like graphic and so on, and transfer this to our Apple IIGS, where most of the job uh, was done. Depending on the platform, getting the game asset was sometimes easy, for example, for the Macintosh, where most of the assets are located in resource file. But for other platforms like the ST, it was much more complex. And the app Atari ST doesn't have a way to easily grab the resource. So we had to buy an extra little hardware card that can be used to stop the game and pump uh, memory data. OK, once we have all the data from the source computer, we have to put this on a floppy disk at the time, and we were needed to bring such a floppy disk on the GS. When the source was a Macintosh, we were using Apple File Exchange on the Mac to write everything uh, on the 800K disk of Macintosh that can be read directly on the GS. When it was PC 724K disk, we were simply using the blue disk card I had on my Apple II GS, which was capable with a PC drive to read such content. At the time, all the development and work on the game asset was done on our Apple II GS. Antoine and I had what I, we can call high capability Apple II GS. So basically, Apple II GS containing at least 4 megabytes of ex memory extension, an accelerated uh, Apple II GS. Mine was running at 9. I think Antoine was 8. Of course, we had a high-speed SCSI uh, card and an hard drive. Of course, at the time, uh, the, the perfect companion was an image writer to printer because it's not with 20 lines of code that you can read a lot of. So printing the source code was, of course, something we were doing on a regular basis to analyze what we were writing. I already speak a little bit about the blue disk card, which was here ready to simplify the exchange uh, between the Atari ST or PC with the 2GS. And of course, on the Apple 2GS, we were running GS Wax 601 at the time. We were using Merlin, Merlin 16 to write code, using Dream Graphics and Iconade for all work about graphic asset, and of course, using SuperConvert to convert pictures coming from the Atari ST or the other platform to have some Apple 2GS ready for use uh, graphic format. The Lemmings development took us about eight months 
to be completed from the very beginning up to the release of the software. These eight months will be about divided in two parts. The first four months were used to grab all the game assets, picture by picture, sprite by sprite, and it took about four months between the Atari ST and the 2GS. The real development part on the GS size took about the same time, four months. The conclusion of the Lemmings development was that, okay, it was possible to do the thing like that, but it was too much time consuming. And creating every software with four months to extract all the resources was probably not the right way to do. And that will be a lesson we will learn for next days. We stop our Apple IIGS development in the late of the 90s. And we went back 10 years later, but with this time with a new ID. Instead of using the same old ways method, this time we were ready to improve the Apple IIGS development, especially by creating a set of tools we can use on modern PCs to not only speed up the Apple IIGS development cycle, but also to increase the quality of the software. What we learned from Linux experience was that we really need to improve the way we were getting game assets. Spending four months for just grabbing all the assets from one game was clearly too much. So we are starting by creating a software named Window Capture, capable to record the output of any game running on emulator on a modern PC. So the same year, we provide Cadius, which is a disk utility capable to write a file available on a PC directly on the Apple IIGS disk image format. The year later, we provide Mr. Sprite, which is a way uh, we can compile sprites uh, and technology. So we basically compile sprite assets to end up with uh, code. And this code will push the sprite on the screen in a very efficient way, because of course, Apple IIGS doesn't have any sprite handling or hardware routine. The same year, we also work on a generic uh, file compressing format named LZ4. Of course, it was uh, publicly available for any platform, but uh, the Apple IIGS unpacking code was missing. Uh, two years later, we have provided Merlin32, which is a modern version of Merlin16 we were using back in the day on the Apple IIGS. This is a very key asset here because it lets you on a modern PC, Mac, Linux, to write your code and automatically create the output file by assembling it in one second. Three years later, Studio uh, was ready. Studio has not yet been released. It's a <coughs> reverse engineering tool that takes as a startup the output of many of the well-known emulator for classic machines, like the Atari ST, the Amiga, the PC DOS, and so on. So starting from the output of this emulator, Studio can grab resource of any game, uh, the source code, and uh, the game assets, the uh, sprite, and so on. And in 2022, we have decided to say, OK, it's probably time to test all of this chain of new modern tool to see how far and what we can do with that. So it starts as a joke and we say, OK, can we do one software a month on this year? It was also the, the 30 years anniversary of Brutal Deluxe Foundation. And with Antoine, we say, OK, let's do that. So during the, this year, we have pushed one new software a month. So we have the Dragon Slayer series, Space Ace, uh, Passenger of the Wing, and so on. And at the end of the year 2022, uh, we did. And so the 12th software was available. The new way of creating software for the Apple IIGS starts usually with, of course, the emulator running the software on the source platform. Could be an Atari ST emulator, Amiga emulator, DOS emulator, anything. So basically, we first have to set up uh, the emulator, find the disk image, and run it. Okay. From the source emulator platform, we usually have a setting to dump the memory content as a memory snapshot. And <clears throat> also, we record the screen using window capture. So with the capability of Studio 
to analyze the memory snapshot uh, of the uh, platform, plus the window capture uh, capable to uh, record the sprite animation settings and so on. At the end, we can easily grab game assets. So basically, we grab the sprite and the sprite movement details, thanks to window capture. We grab gr background screen, color palette, sound, code, game data, and so on. So now, the capture process of the data of the game is pretty efficient and pretty fast. No more for months anyway. So as soon as we are ready with everything uh, that we need to create the game, the development itself starts and works on modern PC. So basically, Merlin32 is used to create the code. Cadius is used to automatically add the output of Merlin32 on a disk image. Mr. Sprite is here to compile the sprite as a binary way. LZ4 is used to compress everything and uncompress uh, on memory. And Studio is also here um, by helping in the sprite animation process, the creation of the icon, and so on. As soon as Merlin32 has assembled all the code, we run automatically one emulator. Here, this is Kegs. And with first way, we can quickly, easily test the game visual. Uh, we can test the sound. We can test the music. We can test the game logic. We can also test the control. And most of the time, this is a cycle between the development part and the test part. Okay. When everything is OK on the emulator, at the end, of course, we need to test on the real PC, which is how Apple to GS. But this time, unlike we did in the 90s, the Apple to GS is only used at the end of the process just for test. And so we don't need a very big Apple to GS machine, no more hard drive and so on, no more accelerated Apple to GS. A basic Apple to GS is enough because it's not part of the development process. It's only here to test the final results. No surprise that it's not because the software is running on KOGS that it will run on the real Apple 2GS. You have many things you need to test on real hardware. For example, what happens if you unplug the joystick when you are playing? Uh, what about hardware like the four play cards and so on? So we still need the Apple 2GS, but we can say that Apple 2GS is only used something like about 8% in the total process of creating new games. Even if the usage of such cross-development tools have simplified the Apple to JS game creation, we still have some issue during the test step of the creation, especially on the emulator. Our top three missing features are, of course, the step-by-step -step run for 65 x sticking code. Okay, We would like to run instruction by instruction. It's not possible because there is nothing at the processor level that can stop an execution after running one operation. What we would like also to have from the emulator is capability to run in slow motion. For example, we are drawing a sprite on the screen. We would like to slow down the emulator so we can see pixel by pixel put on the screen, for example. Uh, what is also important, the capability to record operations. For example, if you are debugging an unpacking uh, routine, it could be thousands of lines of code, and on a specific line of code, something is going to happen. And you don't want to make new, new, next operation, next operation. We would like to have a record of the thousand lines of code somewhere on the file, and so you can find and learn from it. What also could be very useful on the emulator is what we call a multiple data view. Most of the time, what you see on the emulator is what the GS want to show you. Basically, if it's a game, you will see the output with the current uh, graphic page. Of course, what we would like to see is what is behind. Uh, for example, if you are double switching from bank O1 or bank E1, you would like to see what is not displayed currently on the screen. You will also want to follow what is happening in other, other parts uh, of the memory. What could be also interesting is to get input or output from the emulator. So we have to patch a little bit KGS to be able to extract the data from the emulator to be able to analyze what was on the memory at the time. Sometimes we can use the debugger, but they are pretty hard to use, especially you have to read documentation and uh, everyone has a specific and different way to uh, debug. What we can find also hard to find and analyze is the interrupt. Uh, on the interrupt, on the Apple QGS, you set up an interrupt, but you never know exactly when you are going to be called. And so it's hard to see how interrupts interleave uh, in your uh, running code. 
what everyone is dreaming is a memory usage control using assembly language you can write in any part of the memory if something if you do something wrong you can corrupt a part of memory which is not yours and this is nearly impossible to trace uh, what is also interesting is to follow the apple 2 js internal access it means what happens when you access a file through fst and so on most of the time you call the js wet layer and you never see what is behind so of course it could be very interesting to understand what is behind and at the end if you want to improve uh, the game of the program we are running could be interesting to have cycle counting uh, on every operation so if you write a function you would like to know how many cycles does it take uh, in your global pictures uh, get all function statistics how many times this function has been called uh, how many cycles uh, minimum maximum average this function is taken and of course the profiling function it means uh, which function call which and so on and if you improve a little bit your code how you can at the end understand what is the percentage of usage in the total cpu of your current function due to all these missing features we have decided to create a new software named siren to help us to address all of these limitations siren software comes in two parts. The first part is a Windows 64 application running on any Windows. Currently, it's only one exe file, no DLA, no dependency, nothing. It's about one megabyte size, 85,000 lines of code, writing mostly in C language and using only the Windows 32 layer. Uh, should work on any version of, uh, of Windows, modern or old one. And a second part, which is a Siren interface layer, which is a plugin for emulator, which is also C language Windows 32 based uh, code. And this is a source code. So basically we have to modify a little bit the emulator. Here we choose uh, kegs as an uh, example, but it could be any uh, Apple II or Apple II GS emulator. And so this code interface with the emulator has three levels, an init level, an exit level, and in next op level. It means that every time the emulator wants to run an operation from the microprocessor, it has to call first the Siren interface layer to know if it can do it or not. As soon as Siren is connecting through the interface layer to the emulator, the emulator now stops. So we can see Siren as a remote control for the emulator. The inter-processus communication between Siren and the emulator goes in two ways. First, by using the copy data windows message uh, and also using a one megabyte shared memory space. So shared memory space is efficient because they can both executable can write together and exchange data very efficiently. And copy data Windows message are efficient because they are processed as a list. So if Kegs is sending a lot of message to Siren, Siren will process this message in the same order that they have been sent by Kegs. Siren is receiving information and data from KEGS basically in two ways. Operation data, so for every operation by the microprocessor, there is a 59-byte set of data which is sent to Siren to be processed and analyzed. And also, on demand, KEGS can also send all the content of his memory space, the RAM, the ROM, the doc RAM, doc register, and so on, up to Siren uh, for extra analysis also. Siren interface layer take care of the breakpoint uh, engine, which is running directly in the same space as the kegs in order to uh, enhance uh, the processing of the breakpoints. The breakpoint definition are sent by Siren uh, uh, on the one megabyte uh, shared memory. So now let's see Siren in action. And in the first time that will be to analyze current learning application on kegs emulator. Okay, so here we find a standard kegs installation on a Windows machine with his home file and the settings. And we also put Siren in the same folder. So starting kegs won't be different as we do it usually. The only little difference could be seen on the output window where you can see uh, Siren uh, integration and the fact that the Siren layer in kegs say, okay, initialization was, initialization was okay. So we can start uh, Siren. Uh, just to have both all both together on the screen and 
If we want to connect Siren to kegs, we simply have to ask attachment to the emulator and we select kegs window. And at this moment, now Siren takes control of kegs. Uh, the next to be run operation is that one. So currently the next operation would be CMP. And so we can ask uh, kegs to run one by one operation now. In the upper window, we keep trace of all operation history. We can record if we need. So basically, we can record all operation. And the lower part is the current disassembly uh, of the code. Uh, here we see the call stack of operation. So basically, this, op this line of code has a GRSR to this address. And a little bit later, you have an other GSR and so on. So here we can see the call. Uh, we can run operation one by one. We can operation 10 by 10 if we want, 100 by 100, and so on. We can also ask to go to the next, next jump operation or any jump, BNA and so on. We can ask to go to the next function, the next end of function. We can ask VBL by VBL, so running part of, uh, and so on. We can ask for the next interruption, the next toolbox to, to to call, or the next uh, GSOS call. Okay, so this is a way to ask kegs to go on a specific next address. Of course, I can ask kegs also to run as usually. And here we can see that we are uh, getting more and more operations. I can stop also. And what you can see here is a number of operations which has been queued between the Siren case and Siren. So currently, Siren has recorded 29 million of operations, counting for 120 uh, million of cycle. This list of operations can also be used, can be seen here, but of course can be put put on a on a file to be uh, to be analyzed. We can ask to be detached from uh, kegs at any time if you want to uh, let uh, kegs to run on its own. Okay, so let's start one Apple Two GS software running on kegs just to see how Siren can be helpful to understand what's going on on kgs size. Okay, so as you will recognize, this is filmed from Jason Harper, which is a nice um, demo on Apple to GS running. And so once again, we can ask Siren to connect to the emulator. As soon as we have attached, the software freeze, uh, of course, on Cake's part. We can remove this for the moment and focus a little bit on the code here. So we have numerous way to see what's going on uh, on the Apple 2 GS side. We can start by graphic HGR, which is a window we can use to see exactly what is going on uh, on the software. Uh, we ask double eight because the lower part of the screen is using high definition, where the upper size using the standard resolution. We can, if we want to have the same look and feel, ask for field mode enable. And as you can see, we can see what is already drawn uh, by the software and how, of course, the GS render the situation. We can also ask to see uh, the palette and the SCB uh, from the usage of the software that help us to understand how the gradient uh, has been done here. We can continue and run the software, for example, VBL by VBL. And so slowly, you can see, you can see the screen drawing one by one. Okay. Uh, another interesting feature is the video spot. So this is currently location of the spot. And by adding 1,000 cycle by 1,000 operation by 1,000, we can see exactly where we are and when we draw uh, the file. What's interesting is, as you can see, and we will slow down here. Uh, so we can go 1,000 by 1,000, and we are going to stop when we'll be here uh, at the junction of the text part and the graphic part. So in this kind, we go 100 by 100 if we go to be a little bit slower, but here that's okay. So 100 by 100, and as you can see, as soon as the video spot enter this lower part, uh, that will be the time for the software to undraw everything. So uh, of course we can uh, remove the fill mode. And so undraw, undraw part took few, few lines here. And if we continue now is rewriting the part of the screen. Uh, of course, we can ask for film mode to be enabled to see what happened. And so here, very slowly, you can see what happened. And you have a control. So you know that every 
Erase plus draw is done in the lower part of the screen, uh, and that's pretty magic uh, to see exactly how that works. Of course, I can continue to run the software in real time uh, if I want. Okay, so the graphic part is used to understand exactly what happened on the graphic page. Of course, you can not only look at the real page, but you can also ask for a view of any page. Uh, basically here, this is the current data located uh, on E1, but of course, as we have seen, most of the draw probably are done directly on E1 and not O1. Okay, uh, we have many ways to see what happened also. So if we were looking at text page, we could also ask for the text page to be displayed. But in this case, there is nothing because we are not using a, a text part uh, software. We can ask view on specific part of the memory. So at any location of the memory, you can ask for something. Uh, if you want to have a clear idea of what is displayed in the current page, uh, you can ask and you can, of course, adapt the number of uh, picture byte uh, per line and, and so on uh, during your screen. You can also decide to access um, code. So you can disassemble any part of the software automatically. You can create as many disassembly line as you want. So if you need one window plus another one plus another one, no problem. Here I have a GSL to this. I would like to understand where it goes. So it's BBD0, BBD0. And uh, here I am. So I can follow, I can create as many disassembly line uh, as I want. I can also access to what we name Apple 2 js internals. So this is everything that the GS has internally, like all of his vector, the jump vector, uh, the current value and the previous one. So if you want to know if someone has set a ERQ uh, by just changing the location of the jump, it will be easy to see here, for example. Uh, quick draw vector are also displayed. You can follow if application has modified something. This is the list of all applications currently loaded in the Apple 2GS uh, memory. Uh, the path on the file, the current location uh, in memory. You have breakdown by CDA, NDA, and so on. If you want to understand what this NDA is doing, you sub simply double click and it will give you the handle uh, of uh, the application. Here, that's uh, uh, to, to, to shadow right, and you can of course directly see the, the memory data. Uh, you can save or you can disassemble also uh, if you want uh, the code directly. You have the list of all init, all driver, all FST, and every memory, every handle of memory is uh, displayed. You have the purge, the free handle, and so on. So if you want to follow one handle that's pretty straight, you simply double click. You have the handle information here and a pointer to the data. So data can be disassembled uh, automatically, and we, we can see uh, code here, and automatically it recognizes, of course, uh, Apple 2 GS call. Uh, what is interesting also is we have uh, another layer named memory map. Memory map is Apple 2 GS memory. Uh, from bank one to uh, as many as you have. So I say it's four megabytes here. And every part of memory receive a color based on the kind of operation that took place. So basically write means uh, write, red means write, for example. And so we say E1 2000 is of course a graphic page. So we see a lot of write on the graphic page. Uh, we can reset, of course, at any time. So if we run it again a little bit, the software is running and in real time you see the red part, the read write part, the executable part to run. So what we know is currently the software is running in this part. And you can see if I put my mouse, it told me that this part is uh, is by Filmaze, which is our current software. If I go and I select Filmaze automatically, all the Filmaze location goes in dark. And so I can see exactly where I am. This is executable plus write. So there is auto modification code. Most of the code is here. We can see right directly to the, um, the graphic page. So we have a lot of what we name views. 
that lets you see. Of course, if you are more in the sound part, you can you have access to the uh, doc RAM. Uh, if you care about the doc register, you have the value in real time of a doc register and so on. So. Part of the analyzing is uh, controlling the application uh, line by line, group of line by group of line, or by VBL, for example. Uh, and you can record all operation, uh, and you can view in real time exactly what happened inside the Apple IIGS memory. At any time, you can also save a memory snapshot of the current 4 megabyte of the Apple IIGS emulator to a file. So later, you can reload this file uh, into Siren, or you can use this file to be analyzed by other tool. Studio is also one of the tools we use to interpret uh, the snapshot data of the Apple IIGS memory. So, after this short presentation uh, analyzing live application, now let's see how Siren can help in application development. Okay, so let's start to use Siren uh, now with the software we have written named Apple IIGS Karate. The main difference between this demonstration and the previous one is, of course, that for this program, we have the source code. So let's start the software. Let's go computer by computer and let's find what we can do. OK, I would like to put breakpoint uh, on the software and I would like to stop the software. So let's connect first. By default, it stops where we are. OK. Now we have the source code and we have the symbol file. So we ask Siren to load the symbol file of Apple to JS Karate created by Merlin32. And as soon as I do that, I can see now I have labels everywhere. And of course, the source code is easier to read. What I would like to put is two breakpoints, one for the get random function. I would like to be stopped every time this function is called by the software. But also, I would like to know the value returned by this function. And we saw that output number is sent to a accumulator. So around GRN exit label, I would like to print the return value of the accumulator. For that, I simply need to enter in the breakpoint part, create a new breakpoint based on symbol. Let's select the get random number name and add a get random number here. I want to stop on execution on this label. OK, that's perfect. And I'm going to enable the breakpoint. I'm going to create a second breakpoint, this time on the GRN exit label. So once again, let's pick it from here, GRN, GRN GRN exit, and that's the one. And this time, on execution, I don't want to be stopped, but I would like to print something. So let's put GOID, which is a global operation ID, and I need to put a random number output. And I put the random number into A accumulator. I put this in bracket just to display it uh, in the output uh, location. I'm going to enable this breakpoint, and we are ready. Let's run kegs. Let's run the game. And as soon as we reach the get random function, everything stopped. As we can see, the function play game called function play level, which itself calls sprite engine, which itself and so on. And at the end, we have get random number called. Okay. I can continue to run, but every time the function is called, we have a stop uh, by the software. In between, we can see here the print of the random value of every call of this function. I can, of course, at any time disable the breakpoint. For example, I'm going to disable the stop one, but I'm going to keep the one who print. I'm going to run, stop when needed, and I can see in between all the value, and as we, I can hope, the value are nearly all random. I can continue. Let's stop the execution of the software. So we go back at the beginning and we stop here. So basically, we had a full loop of game execution. And now I can have some statistics about my functions. So here we have the list of all the functions. Of course, I'm going most interesting by the one inside Apple to JS Karate. So how many times I've been called and so on. So let's sort by name and I'm going to grab off my function altogether. So 
I can find all my random number of function has been called 20 times. The total number of cycles spent by this 20 call was 1480 cycle. The minimum number of cycles to pay the function was 74 cycle. Min and max are about the same. It's not the case for all functions, of course. So that's interesting. You know how long, how many times every function has been called, how long it, it took, and so on. Another interesting part is what we name the profiling. So basically, we were in the root process here, and we have called the play game uh, function. So, and for the moment, the total percentage size time was uh, zero, simply because we didn't have uh, play a lot. But if we enter, we have the number of time uh, we run. Play level was the one who took uh, the more time, and so on. So. Play level itself called uh, get index, load, unpack, and so on. So you can follow all the sprite engine uh, has been called three times and has 27 lower functions and so on. So you can clearly go and find which are at every time the function taking the much number of cycle and the percentage. Of course, you can save this as a tree for a better analysis. Okay, even if the software looks completed and runs, runs fine, there are few things that left to do before releasing and sending it to everyone. So basically, few things are missing. For example, the capability for Siren to send data, uh, especially if we modify uh, the memory and so on, uh, back to KGS. We would like also to track the docram read and write, especially in the memory map uh, where we have the colors. We don't track them now. We would like also to export the profiler information as a tree uh, or graph. Uh, could be interesting visually, of course. Uh, I have some work to do on the UI itself. Uh, for example, let the window to be resizable and so on. I need to improve a little bit the disassembly part. We'd like to bring much more built-in Apple II symbol so we can uh, navigate in the source uh, of the ROM more easily. Uh, could be interesting to have a dedicated uh, version of the memory map for the Apple II with a 128K with the um, language card bank and so on. Currently, we see the memory as Apple II just sit. Uh, could be interesting to improve a little bit the KEX integration. For the moment, I have not yet discussed with Kent uh, about the way we did it. So probably we could probably make uh, some progress in this part. And of course, we need to write the documentation, create a web page on our website for the product, and to publish uh, as usually the software and the source code. Thank you uh, for listening, and we are going to see you very soon in the Q&A.